Lord, we just thank you for this day, Father. God, I thank you for your word. I pray that as we get into it, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us. God, you know what we each need to hear today. Father God, I pray that this meal would be prepared for us, that we'd feast upon your word, and that you would minister to our brothers and sisters that will listen to this online. Lord, prepare our hearts to be your servants as your children. Lord, prepare our hearts just to, to minister to your people, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue our study this morning in the book of Isaiah, chapter 36. It starts a new section of the book of Isaiah, these next several chapters, where it talks about a, a historical account of King Hezekiah and an attack against the southern kingdom of Israel, Jerusalem and Judah, Benjamin and Judah, against the Assyrians. And, and yes, this is going to be a physical attack that we read about, but it's spiritual. Everything behind it is spiritual. And so there's going to be a lot of parallels for us as we go through this, that yes, there are physical battles. We go through temptations. People say certain things to us, but they are spiritual battles at the root. Just as this is with Hezekiah, the Jewish people, and the Assyrians. Isaiah 36, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Shennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Aspha, the recorder, came out to him. Then Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? I say to you, I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look! You are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into the hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? And said to Judah in Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, to the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses, if you are able on your part to put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Have I now come out up without the Lord against this land and destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to Reb Shekha, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. And do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words, and not to the men who sit on the wall, who will eat and drink their own waste with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and the city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present, and come to me. And every one of you eat from his own vine, and every one from his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take away, take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, and the Lord saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath in Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their countries from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But they held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household of Shibna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told them the words of Rabshakeh. And there we have chapter 36 of Isaiah, this 
battle physically, but it is really a spiritual battle. The Assyrians want them to submit to them, to pay tribute to them, and eventually they will take their land and then take them back to their own land of Assyria. To get a little bit more background information, turn with me to 2 Kings 18. It's going to give us a little insight into Hezekiah, what he has done, and also a lapse of faith he had right before what we're reading in Isaiah today. So again, the history of Hezekiah and the lapse of faith he had prior to this, which emboldened the Assyrians to come against them more. 2 Kings ver or chapter 18, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Again, at this point, Israel's broken up into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. So many times they compare a good king to David. He did what was right like his father David. So Hezekiah is a good king. He is not a man without sin, and we will read that, but he is a good king. He does what's right in God's eyes overall. Verse 4. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. So here he is, Hezekiah comes in, he gets rid of the idolatry that they've been practicing, and he restores true worship. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him of all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Again, this king is very unique. Hezekiah is a man of God. Not a man without fault, not a man without sin, but a genuine man of God. Verse 7, the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and his territory, from the watchtower to the fortified city. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmenser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. So in the fourth year of Hezekiah, the northern kingdoms of Israel, the ten northern tribes, are besieged. And it says in verse 10, And at the end of three years they took it. And the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. Samaria referring to the northern kingdoms. They got taken captive by the Assyrians, taken to the Assyrian land. Then the king of Assyria carried Israel away captive to Assyria and put them in Hala by the harbor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. And they would neither hear them nor do them. So the northern tribes would not listen to God. They'd get taken captive. But here Hezekiah is still standing. But Assyria, in a physical sense, is a real threat. But in a spiritual sense, if they submit to God, there's not a threat. Verse 13. And in the 14th year, King Hezekiah, Shnechereb, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lashik, saying, I have done wrong. Turn away from me, and whatever you impose on me, I will pay. So here we go. I will pay. I'll do it. This is his lapse of faith right here. The guy starts out good, and yes, he is a man, he's a king, like no other king that Israel has had. He is like his father David, but even like that, he's very unique. He is a man of God that's torn down altars. He's walked by faith. He's withstood the Assyrians, but here comes his weak point. He saw the other people get taken captive. He saw their apostasy and what happened. And here he has this lapse of faith. He says, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. He didn't do wrong, but he gave in to his enemy. And here's what happens when you give in to your enemy. Many times you embolden your enemy. Because what we read about right here is what happens right before we're reading about in Isaiah today. He emboldened his enemy. Oh, I've done wrong. I, I will submit to you. Just don't harm us. Well, what did we read today in Isaiah? No, he's coming back for more. And this is oftentimes what happens when you make a deal with your enemy. 
at the moment, it seems like I'm going to have peace. You get peace at the moment, but anguish later on. Just give me peace at the moment. I, I, I feel endangered. I've done wrong. Please don't bother me. I'll give you whatever you want. This can even happen in parenting when, when we compromise. You give a kid something they shouldn't have. They, they've kicked and screamed, and you give in to their moaning and whining. And then they're emboldened to do it again and again. Whenever you cave into somebody's demand that is ungodly, you generally embolden them. They want more next time. They want more. They never repented. They never stopped. Hezekiah is emboldening his enemies. Verse 15. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid, and he gave it to the king of Assyria. He's taking God's stuff and giving it to the enemy of God. He took the doors from the temple, took the gold off the doors, and gave it to God's enemy. These are the same doors that King Hezekiah had repaired during a time of revival. It says in 2 Chronicles 29.3, In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. These are the same doors that he repaired during a time of revival. Now he is caving in and taking the gold off of them and giving it to his enemy. A lapse of faith. Now, overall, he's a godly man, but yes, he does have his sins. We need to be careful in this battle that we don't have these lapses of faith. This is a very real battle. When you have these lapses of faith and when you cave into the request of your enemy, you often embolden him. And that's what's going to happen. See, Hezekiah did this. He caved to his enemy. And so if you'll turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 36, this is where it takes us, what we read about today. And chapter 36 of Isaiah says, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Shennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against them, or came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. So that's what we just read about. So between verse 1 and 2, what happens is that Hezekiah pays him tribute, says, Oh, we've done wrong. Please don't bother us anymore. We cave into you. So in verse 2, here's what happens after the enemy hasn't been emboldened. Then the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh, with a great army from Lashish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. He emboldened his enemy. His enemy did not back down. Now, Rabshakeh, that means a chief cupbearer, but he's more than a chief cupbearer. He's some type of chief of staff here. This, this one of these right-hand men to the king of Assyria. He shows up and he shows up with his great army. He is emboldened now knowing that Hezekiah has backed away. Hezekiah is in running mode. If you put your hand to the plow and look back, you are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. You need to keep your hand to the plow and move forward. Do not let your enemy persuade you to stop. You know, the enemy could try to persuade me, oh, Rob, don't bother pastoring. Why would you want to do that? Just stop. To go do something else. Well, I'll tell you what, as soon as you get in that retreat mode, he comes after you full force. It's not like he's going to stop bothering you just because you've retreated a little. As soon as you retreat, he's going to chase you down. It doesn't matter. Whatever God has called you to do, the minute you retreat from God's calling on your life, the enemy is going to come after you stronger. But you're often convinced in your mind, well, if I retreat, if I cave in just a little, if I pay tribute to him, if I acknowledge him and I stop doing certain things that I'm doing for the Lord, well, then the enemy will stop bothering me. That is not true. If you cave in to the enemy's request for your life, he's now got you running. He's now going to chase you down. And that's what's happening right here. Then the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh, his chief cupbearer, chief of staff, with a great army from Lashish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. He has a great army with him. Now, when this happens, it's important to remember that greater are those who are with you if you're a real believer than those that are with the enemy. Back when the Syrians, not the Assyrians, but the Syrians came up to come against Elisha. In 2 Kings 6, it says, Therefore he sent horses, this is the king of Syria, and chariots and a great army there and they came by night and surrounded the city and when the servant of the man of god arose early and went out there there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots and a servant said to him alas my master what shall we do so the servant elijah sees all these horses and chariots he sees this great army and so elijah answers and says do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them 
And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You can't see it right now, but there is a spiritual dimension, a spiritual realm. And God, he has his ministering angels there. And Elisha knew that, and he prayed that his servant's eyes would be opened. And even right here, as Hezekiah has his great army from the Assyrians coming up to scare them, to threaten them. Remember that God is in control. If God wants to win the battle for the Jewish people, he will. And we know that he's going to. It's that simple. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper gate, or the upper pool on the highways, on the highway to Fuller's Field. Verse 3. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. So here we have these people who are higher up in the kingdom of Hezekiah coming out to meet Rabshakeh. Then Rabshakeh said to them, the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. Call them out on one of their sins. The Jewish people of the southern kingdom were trusting in Egypt. And this is a legit sin. Here the enemy is. Hey, you have sinned. You've trusted in Egypt, and Egypt has done nothing for you. Egypt being a picture of the flesh in the Bible, many times people go to the flesh or to Egypt to protect them in a time of battle. And here the enemy is reminding them that in the past you have trusted in Egypt. And even God has rebuked them for that. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 1, he says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel but not of me, who devise plans but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt." And have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and the trust in the shadow of Egypt. They have been rebuked in the past for trusting in Egypt. They had devised plans, but not of God's spirit. And there are many churches that do that today. They devise plans, or even people that profess Christ will devise plans, but not of God's spirit. It's a fleshly plan. It's a plan that has the strength of flesh in it, not that if God, it's not a plan that says, well, unless God intervenes, we're going down. It's a plan with all these backup plans that how man can save the day instead of God saving the day. And God has rebuked them. And he says, therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame. (laughs) And trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. And here it is. Here comes the enemy. It's going to remind them. You know what you've done in the past? You've trusted in your flesh. You've trusted in Egypt. And if we're honest, us, we've all been in a situation where we have trusted Egypt. In Egypt. We've trusted in our flesh. We've trusted in somebody else other than God. And we need to repent of that. But know that the time will come when you're in a battle that the enemy will remind you, and hopefully you found your place out of repent of trusting in Egypt. The enemy will remind you, don't you remember in the past you trusted in Egypt and it failed? And you have to honestly say, yeah, I, I know that in the past I've trusted in Egypt. I know that it failed. But here's what the enemy will do. And he's going to do this right here. The enemy is going to take that time that you trusted in Egypt and try to make it no different than the time you're going to trust in God. Tries to make it one and the same. Tries to make your faithless moment, your decision to be faithless, the same as your decision to be faithful. He'll do that. Hey, you've, you've made this bad decision and it failed. Well, and you can say, yeah, I have made this bad decision and it failed, but I've repented. I don't do that anymore. I'm trusted in God now. But the enemy wants to make as if trusting in Egypt and trusting in God are the same thing. Trusting in man's strength and trusting in God's strength. He makes it as if it's the same decision. It's not. Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? 
and said to Judah in Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? See? Oh, you've trusted in Egypt. But, but, the enemy says, but if you tell me this, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. Listen, if, if you say that we, you, you trust in God, hold on now. Isn't it this Hezekiah who got rid of all the altars? All the, all, and these were actually pagan altars? But see, if they come back with this response, oh no, we trust in God. We don't trust in Egypt anymore. We trust in God. And see, the enemy, what he wants to do in your life and what he's doing right here is trying to make your past sinful decision to trust in the strength of flesh the same as trusting in the Lord. Oh, you, you said you trust in Egypt. That didn't work. But now you say you trust in the Lord. Well, that's not going to work either. And that's where you need to know that, yes, your past trusting in Egypt was sin, but you're not doing that now. But now you are going to trust in the Lord. And don't let the enemy deceive you into thinking, well, you know, you're, that's right. I, I, I did trust in Egypt in the past and that did fail. And trusting in the Lord is probably going to fail because I make bad decisions. Yeah, you have made bad decisions in the flesh. But the truth is, when you, to, when you decide by the Holy Spirit to submit to whatever the Word of God says, you will have success. And that's oftentimes when you're looking at something and the whole army's up against you, and you're saying, that, that I will lose unless God intervenes. I have no strength unless God saves me. And now this gets interesting when Reb Sheka says, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah in Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. So now he's acting as if Hezekiah's revival was sinful, that it angered God. Because remember Hezekiah, we read this in 2 Kings that Hezekiah came around and what did he do? He got rid of all the high places. He got rid of all the idols. He took care of all the, got rid of them and said, you shall worship in this place. You shall worship in Jerusalem, where God said to worship. So it was a great time of revival. But now what's happening is he's trying to get the Jews to question that time of revival and say, well, maybe you upset God. And he's not saying maybe. He wants them to think maybe. But he's actually trying to get them, you have upset God by standing for the truth. You did the wrong thing because you stood and did what was right. You angered God by doing what was right. I'm going to read to you from Second Chronicles 30. Verse 1, I'm going to skip around on some verses here, but it says, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep, pass, to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. So he had actually invited the northern kingdom to, hey, c come and keep Passover in Jerusalem. Let's worship God like God told us to worship him. Then in verse 5 of Second Chronicles 30, so they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan that they should come to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, since they had not done it for a long time in a prescribed manner. Then runners went throughout all of Israel and Judah with letters from the king and his leaders and spoke according to the command of the king. Children of Israel, this is what they said, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Return to God. And even as the northern tribe is already having trouble with Assyria, tell them, look, return to God, God will return to you. He had true revival go, and he got rid of all the idolatry. This is the first thing you do in revival. You get rid of the sin. You get rid of the idols. You get rid of the false worship, and then you restore true worship to God. Get rid of the false, tear it down, break it down, and say, this is what God wants. That's what he did. This is a man that led a revival. And so the runners passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun. But they laughed at them and mocked them. So the northern tribes as a whole mocked and laughed at this call for revival to come back to Jerusalem. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And so here we have Rabshakeh calling this revival an action that angered God implying that God is upset with Hezekiah because Hezekiah had all these false altars, all this false worship torn down and restored worship in Jerusalem saying, you should worship at this place as if God was upset about it. Here's the deal. Your enemy is going to come to you and convince you that what you have done right for God or try to convince you is indeed sin and you've angered God. Well, it's not true. There's things I've taken a stand as a pastor 
And of course, the enemy would try to have me second guess what the Word of God says. One of them is Christmas. I, I quit. This church does not celebrate Christmas. We do not celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ with the birthday of Tammuz. Why? Because it is sin. It is forbidden according to Scripture. Yes, it's tradition, and a lot of people say, well, God's upset. Look at the people that left over that. Well, people were upset, but they couldn't hear the truth. See, in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, These are the statutes and judgments which you should be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you to possess all the days that you live on earth. So as long as you're living on earth, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains, on the high hills, and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down their carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. Now, the holiday we know is Christmas, far preceded the times of Christ on earth. It is the birthday of Tammuz. The idea of cutting down a tree and decorating all precedes that. When the Jews went into that land, they were to destroy all those things. And here's why. God says, you shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. God will not be worshiped with pagan holidays. But you start saying that, you start tearing that down and say, no, we will not worship God with that. Of course, the enemy's going to come and say, God's upset with you. you. You've gotten rid of his birthday. Look at all the people that love this. Oh, no, God's not upset with me. God's quite pleased. I've walked by faith in doing that. Even though I do have a Christmas tree, all this is an idol in people's living rooms. In 1 John 5, 21, it says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Now, what would the enemy do? Rob. Surely God's upset with you. Look at all the people that remember Jesus on December 25th. And now you've gotten rid of that. And you could say, look at all the people that worship God at these high places and these, and these idolatrous altars. And Hezekiah's made him, God mad because Hezekiah got rid of him. See, when you have true revival, the enemy's going to come after you and try to tell you, oh, you shouldn't have done that. That's the way people worship God. Oh, you're not going to do seeker-sensitive stuff. Why not? Because it's not in the Bible. One of the other things, the whole idea of age-segregated worship. Now, there's not a particular sin in the Bible where I can say to break people up into an age group is a sin. I cannot say that, so please don't misunderstand me. I can't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. However, age-segregated worship, such as children's ministry, and I get that some kids cannot sit still, and so it is appropriate at times. It is, there are times where it's appropriate. But this whole idea of age-segregated worship has led to sin. And it has led to issues. It is not prescribed in the Bible. And one of the issues, there are two main issues I see, but one of them is, is that we are teaching kids that they must be entertained. They have to be entertained. Church has to be fun. No, they need to be taught the word of God. A church is not about entertainment. That is not what it's about. But it's the idea, oh, if children's ministry is fun, the kids will want to come, and then the parents will want to come back. And a lot of parents think that, well, as long as my kid's entertained, then that's where I want to go. Listen, during time revival, we're getting rid of that. We're not playing that game. We're going to not play the game where someone has to be entertained to come to church. It is my heart from following the Bible and being led by the Holy Spirit is that as young as we can get them into the, the adult service, get them in. The second thing that that does with age segregated worship, again, the Bible does not declare that having a group of a certain age is a sin, but it does lead to certain sins. And it's not in the Bible. They did not do that in Bible times. One of the other problems is it often takes the responsibility off of the parents to teach your children and puts on somebody else. When it's really the parent's job to teach the children, it's the parent's job to have a discussion after church about what the kids heard in service. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women in all who could hear and understand on the first day of the seventh month. All who could hear and understand. If you can hear and understand. I understand that a one or two year old may not understand. But if you can hear and understand, I mean, even a three year old has trouble, but as is, is, is young of an age as they can understand, get him there. And then he read from it in an open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. This is a long service of reading the word of God. Men and women and all who could understand. And before the men and women and those who could understand, in the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. When we come to church, yes, it's for fellowship and being attentive to this book right here. It's about being attentive. It's not about being entertained, but age segregated worship. We've taught a generation of people that come to church is not about being attentive to the word, but about being entertained 
about you liking it. No, it's about being attentive to this book. That's why we come together. Fellowship, worship God, attentive to this book. In Ezra chapter 10 and verse 1. Now, uh, while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping and bowing down before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept very bitterly. Everybody, men, women, and children. Very large assembly. And she Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and we have taken pagan wives from the people of the land. And yet now there is no hope in Israel in spite of this. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them according to the advice of my master and those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. This is very serious adult worship. Children present. The children should be present to see the adults worship. It should be our, our desire as parents to have our children mature in the faith. And so if you get rid of children's ministry and you get rid of these things and people might say, well, you've done something bad. God's upset with you that you did that. No, God is not upset. God is not upset with the fact that we're doing something where we want children present. And one of the other sins it does often lead to when you do age-segregated worship is that it takes the responsibility off of the parents and puts on to someone else to teach a child. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. You've got to teach these commandments diligently to your children. That means very diligent. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you sit down in your house, talk about God and his commands. And when you walk by the way, so these days when you drive in the car, talk about God and his commands. And when you lie down and you rise up, talk about God and his commands. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. God's word everywhere. Always talking about God's word. Starts right in the house. Family worship. So during a time of true revival, like Hezekiah had true revival. And what happened? Hezekiah tore down the altars, proclaimed true worship had to be done in Jerusalem as God had prescribed. And I, God's preparing my heart to be here for a time of revival. And I'll tell you what, we're not going to look like a lot of the false churches. They're not gonna, there's not going to be false doctrine. There's not going to be seeker-sensitive church growth methods. But it's going to be a tearing down of those things and a trusting in God and His Word and His Holy Spirit to do the work. Something different than what we've seen in this generation, but nothing different than what we see in the Bible. And here it is. He says in verse 7, But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? And said to Judah in Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar. That is the altar in Jerusalem. Hezekiah restored true worship. And what the enemy is trying to do is trying to take his sinful desires or his sinful trust in Egypt and liken it to his true faithful choices to trust in God and to eradicate false worship and to restore true worship. So when you're in the battle, know where you stand. Know that what you've done for God is right. And know that, yeah, there may have been times where you trusted in Egypt, that's sin, but the two are not the same. Walking by faith and walking in the trust of Egypt are not the same. And you never make God mad by obeying him. Verse 8. Now, therefore, I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your own part to put riders on them. I urge you. I urge you, give a pledge to my master, king of Assyria. Remember, he's been emboldened. He's already given him a pledge when he shouldn't have. So now he's just emboldened. His enemy is now coming. Hey, get, come on, give us another pledge. And only that, not only give us another pledge, as we read on, he's going to say, look, we'll take you back to our land too. No way. You cannot give in to the enemy. And, and ultimately, what is he trying to do to Hezekiah's people or Hezekiah's guys in leadership at the moment? That's who he's addressing. He's trying to get them to fear the king of Assyria instead of fearing God. To have a greater fear for the king of Assyria than they would God. Give a pledge to the king of Assyria. God has not told him to do that. Come on, do it. Bow down. Do it. What does Matthew 10, 28 tell us? I do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So you know what? You don't fear guys like this. 
Yeah, you might have a physical threat, but they can't put your soul in hell. Only God can put your soul in hell. So when this temptation comes, you say, I fear God alone. What about the recent whole pandemic we had? Let's create a whole bunch of branch COVIDians where COVID's become the new religion. They, they follow COVID. It's all about COVID. Their lifestyle has literally revolved around the branch. I call it branch COVIDians like the branch Davidians now. But the whole idea of following COVID, COVID rules, COVID restrictions in the center of their life was COVID. Anthony Fauci and the experts, they're false prophets. They worshiped COVID. It became their religion. COVID restrictions, COVID rules, throw a mask on your face. All to keep COVID happy, they had feared COVID. And there are pastors who went down that road who said, oh, government tells us we got to fear. And it's all a lie. We got to fear this. You know what? You have to fear God. They paid their tribute to COVID. We will not pay our tribute to COVID. We pay our tributes to God. We're not going to fear the pandemic virus. You know what? Even if it turned out to be the way they wanted it to be and killed a whole bunch of us, we're still not going to fear it. We're going to fear God. Now, by the grace of God, it was quite a flop. But in the name of fear, now you got to get an injection that can alter your DNA and further harm your body. In the name of the fear of COVID, pay your tribute to COVID. And there are pastors who went along with this, unfortunately. And there are also pastors who sat on the fence. and they, they, Their goal was no longer to please God, but to pay tribute to COVID to also please those who are paying tribute to COVID. They, they had a divided congregation. Well, we got to keep this side happy, those who don't believe in paying tribute to COVID, and those that do pay tribute to COVID, well, we got to keep them happy too. That's just called fearing man. That's called being like King Saul. See, as a pastor and as a man of God, you're called to just, you know, I pay tribute to, I am going to fear God. I'm going to respect God. I'm going to fear God. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to do what God's word says. Not what the government tells me to do as a pastor, but what God and his Holy Spirit tell me to do as a pastor. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 24, this is after Saul keeps the, Amal the king of Amal the Amalekites alive. He keeps some of the, the spoil, which he was supposed to get rid of all of it. Samuel comes and rebukes him. And then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. There are a lot of pastors like that that fear the people and obey their voice. Well, the people want you to follow some COVID restrictions and pay tribute to COVID, or they don't want you to speak certain doctrines because if you speak against Calvinism, you're going to split the congregation in half and get rid of half the people. They don't want you to speak out against age-segregated worship because that will make people mad. Don't do this. Don't do that. And you know what it is? It's the fear of the people instead of the fear of God. Paying tribute to the people instead of paying tribute to God. And that's what the enemy wants you to do. He just wants you to pay tribute to something or somebody else other than 